Um, good evening and welcome to this committee uh, meeting of the Adults Vision Care and Health Search Committee. Members will see that the first item on the agenda is to elect a new chair. So could I please ask for a nominee? Uh, I chair the proposed CC. Is that seconded? Seconded. Um, uh, is that agreed? Agreed. Okay, wonderful. Um, so please tonight is um, our new chair. Thank you for electing this chair. Um, this now means we can elect the new vice chair, which is Simon. Um, can we have someone to nominate? Which is me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, someone to second. Thanks, sir. Great. Um, all in favour of appointing Councillor Saren as vice chair, please raise your hand. Um, in all our meetings, I think it's appropriate for us to start with a 70 second silence so for those who have their lives in the Grand Lodge Um Thank Um, many thanks everyone, and now we can move to the main portion of the meeting of the Adult Vision Care Committee. The event is being streamed live on YouTube, and members of the public and the media are welcome to watch. The meeting will make you listen to the stuff that's taking place. We'd also like to welcome all visitors here and everyone watching on YouTube. Um, we start with apologies of absence. Um, we've received apologies from the pastor. Oh, now just the pastor. Um, to the day of the health march is also some apologies for the meeting. Um, declarations of interest. Confirm I have no declarations of interest to me regarding any items on the agenda. Do any members have any interest to declare? Employee C and W NHS. Um, the minutes of the meeting meeting on the 27th of June 2022 have been circulated. Does the committee agree? Agree to sign off this report. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and welcome our first report. Developing new community developing new community diagnostic centers. This report has been brought to us from a colleague in the integrated care system. Here today to discuss the report of access Dr. Jeff Lang, consultant radiologist, imaging clinic, clinical director. Andrew Northwest University Healthcare NHS first, and Damien Brady, CDC Program Manager, West Standard Network. Um, Damien, thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much for providing us with the Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just get started. Thank you for the introduction, um, and thanks for the invite today. Um, so, community diagnostic centres are essentially a national initiative, as you can see. Um, essentially to try to increase diagnostic capacity uh, within um, England as a whole has generally very low diagnostic capacity and you can see that we're either the lowest or one of the lowest within the OECD countries um, and because of the loss of the relative lack of diagnostic capacity that really came to a head during Covid because there was a further reduction because of you know things like having to put in control measures, sickness uh, and a, a reduction in the referrals because patients were staying at home and they weren't really coming in. And that's created a, a, a hidden population which we're trying to get at and, and a, a large backlog that we really want to tackle. And so the aim is, um, you know, 
and set on a, a year on year increase in demand that we've sort of known and is, is from the micro digital of sort of six to seven percent. So looking at the, the CDCs, one of the, the big things is, you know, there, there's six um, areas where we want that to sort of improve things. Focusing on increasing diagnostic capacity, and that's mainly to improve population health. So we're looking to improve the health of North West London as a whole, and also crucially to try to reduce the um, patient deprivation and the inequalities within the within the system. And so we looked at the whole area. We did a lot of um, work on looking at areas of deprivation, and you can see on the map there that there are sort of two main areas. One around sort of Hanwell, Southall, and now there's a crescent on the right side. And it's sort of, and, and the way we've looked at it is to create one centre at Ealing, which would serve that area of deprivation, and then around the present there will be two sort of spokes, which are Wilson, Wilson and Um But overall, the idea is to try to really reduce that sort of, um, reduce that uh, deprivation, because it is quite significant as, as detail. And I'll hand over to things. Lovely, thanks Phil. So, um, as Phil said, we've, we've really tried to focus in on those two areas in particular. We're just thinking about how we can improve overall access for the entire population of North West London. Um, and that's really come down to what you see in the reports around the, the areas and the locations for where we're looking to use sites uh, for CBCs. We've been through quite an extensive process of our sort of wider stakeholders around looking at um, available NHS estates um, and looking at the accessibility of those in terms of both public transport um, as well as private car use and then overlaying that with um, uh, data that we have around the, the filters around our deprivation index across North West London. So um, it's been quite an extensive process. We are now in a, uh, a fairly fortunate position where we have, um, we, we've been through all of our sort of gateway approvals uh, both from a sort of trust level across North West London, then across London, then up to the National Programme team. So that means we've, we've managed to attract all the capital, importantly, um, and all of the revenues actually start on run with So this is a really positive um, situation for our population in North West London. Um, and yeah, um, to open up to, to questions. Thank you. Is there any questions else? Actually, you maybe. No, 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 Yes, yeah, so you're referring to the index of deprivation yes. um, as part of that. So, so yes, um, these are quite extensive facilities to get up and running. So um, as you can see, as you've got it here on page 14 and 15, the range of services that will be provided in these facilities, they are very extensive. Um, some of them are particularly architecturally quite significant. So MRI and CT services in particular um, have quite a lot of requirements. So, one of the key areas that we were given a steer on from the system, but also nationally in terms of the programme, was we had to look to utilise NHS estate. Um, so that was a very clear ask of us to do so. Um, when you take into account the range of services, um, depending on how you split it, you needed a minimum, or very much a minimum, of 1,000 square metres. Um, so that actually then took us into a very long list of NHS estates across the sector to a very small list um, in terms of available estates with 1,000 square metres. Then when you start overlaying in the uh, deprivation index and the uh, patient uh, accessibility, um, so the public transport accessibility levels in particular, um, that, that, that gave you a picture of just, you start overlaying all of those different things together of a very small list of available NHS sites. Um, so yes, there were, there were several different um, uh, items that, that sort of led to that. Just, sorry, yeah. Um, do you want to finish your question then, Roshan? Sorry, yeah, just, just one more, um, if I may. Have you, when sort of designing and going out to consultation, have you taken any learnings from any other uh, areas that have already done this? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, it's uh, obviously, as Phil said, it's a national programme. Um, so we, we meet, so, so for myself personally, um, I meet my counterparts across London um, on a fortnightly basis and, and learn from. Um, uh, the respective CDCs that have gone live. I think it's fair to say it's still fairly new. Um, so 
this is uh, what is referred to as year two of the programme. So it was only you know the first CDCs went live last year. Um, we did implement what was known as sort of early adopter uh, facilities. So uh, if that's at Ealing Hospital, which uh, uh, Phil works at part of that, um, we set up a temporary MRI hub and another one at West Middlesex Hospital as well. Um, high volume, low complexity uh, case mix, really good um, patient staff experience, um, very popular. Um, it's, been, it's been our own learning from what we've done, um, and, and as I say, learning from colleagues across London, there's just been another one that's gone live um, uh, with a, a, a visit from Secretary of State in the last couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, um, I read your um, report and it was very impressive. However, there was little information about how they were brought about, about reducing the hair qualities beyond the geographic location of centres. If you went about just putting the centres in the five areas, what else is being done to reduce health inequalities overall? Residents themselves indicated that hair is more important than the breathing times and the geographic location. What are the anticipated waiting times? How will centres be staffed and what will the level of enterprise skills be? So, uh, in terms of the inequality side, you're right, it isn't just about location, but um, but location is a significant um, part of it in terms of if you're not able to get to a, a place easily, then often you can, you know, things tend to slip, patients tend to uh, not attend appointments, so it makes it a lot more difficult for them when they're juggling jobs, etc. And so we found that, um, you know, it, it will be uh, packaged into a, an additional program in terms of linking with the GPs, um, uh, speaking to communities and trying to get them to, you know, see that there are CDCs around and to try and bring that, you know, community in so that uh, we are able to tackle it from a, from a health, health perspective. Plus, we're working with the various uh, groups such as, um, you look at the targeted lung health checks, um, that's being rolled out as a, as a screening program and we're looking to try and introduce that within these areas as well and that also comes with its own um, additional pathways and, and from the screening side we have these respiratory hublets, which uh, the respiratory team are, you know, using to, to, you know, one, to look at patients with chronic lung diseases, but also to look at patients who have had um, sick really of, um, of COVID and who have respiratory uh, illness. And so the, the rationale for those is to have multiple, and then we would then put those within these CDCs. Um, would you mind just repeating the second and the last one? The second was, what are the anticipated waiting time? So the waiting times at the moment, the national ones are six six weeks with regards to routine um, routine waiting times, and then obviously we have your two wait, and there's also the new faster diagnostic standard to to get a cancer diagnosis within 28 days. Those things are in already. Um, as a sector, we're doing pretty well, um, you know, across most areas, but we still don't have enough um, capacity and with with the acute um, need. So. One of the things that we really need to do is, uh, with winter coming, with the um, increase, the limitations in number of beds, and the increase in diagnostics at the acute sites, such as Chelsea, Westminster, and Imperial, and West, and Hillingdon. Again, the, you know, as Damien said, the high volume, low complexity imaging and uh, other diagnostics can be moved to these CDCs to free up space. So it's just trying to get a balance between um, looking at planned work. But also offloading work from the um, few trusts so that they can then tackle and improve their you know care so that overall population outcomes are improved. Yeah. And how are you going to be started? So it's a very good question. Uh, staffing is one of the biggest risks. Um, we as James mentioned uh, are fortunate in that we do have funding for revenue for um, I think you know 18 months and all and the system has agreed to continue that going forwards. Uh, we are, we have, um, uh, how can I put it, sort of working groups looking at that, looking at potentially, um, we have set up a number of academies um, in London Northwest, and we have these sort of practitioners to try and increase the number of um, ultrasonographers, uh, in MI radiographers, to really improve the staffing, the staffing model of that. We're also looking at um, people from, you know, trying to see if we can recruit from, um, Broad. It's basically a lot of different uh, approaches to try and 
fill in the gap because the gap is going is going to be significant. There's no doubt about it, um, and it, and it, and it is a risk. But I think we're in a good position to be able to, you know, given that we're going to start this in in this year, we're looking to ramp up in this year so that we will be in a good place by that. You know, a lot of those positions will be filled. So what other skills and enterprise skills that you must build in order to cover that? Um, do you mean in terms of, so, you know, radiologists who are able to uh, report the scans, um, or the radiographers who will be able to run the, run the CT and MRI scanners, sonographers for ultrasound, obviously cardiologists and um, cardiac uh, technicians for ECG, echo, etc., and for autonomous. Um, and then there'll be another um, cohort of admin to help out. And is that what you mean, mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, thank you. Oh, okay. um, thanks for coming tonight. And thanks for the report. So I, I've actually got a few questions on, on um, what's written in the paper. And the first one is this whole idea of local, which I feel is what we're trying to get at here with community diagnostic um, centres. So I guess I was just wondering, what do our residents do at the moment, um, given that this is a new thing. Where do they go for their diagnostic tests? Um, and, and as you say, I mean, these are quite complicated. These are quite complicated tests. So how far are they travelling? Because you kind of look at Ealing and Wembley, and I mean, I, I know it doesn't feel like that, but I think if you're, you know, you've got some, you know, you're not very able to get the bus, or you know, you're on crushes, or you've got some other. Um, physical problems, then actually getting to Ealing and Wembley feels like a long way to, to, to go. So that's my first question is, what are our residents currently doing? Is this going to help them get to these um, test centres quicker and easier? Um, the second part is about um, timings, um, because I, I noticed that the first one is due to open in 20, April 2023. And I mean, obviously, you said that these are units that currently exist, so I know you're not starting them from scratch. But obviously, they need to be fitted out, I guess, with more of the equipment that's required to do these diagnostic tests. And we're talking about something that's six months away. So is it feasible that they're going to be ready uh, within that time? Um, and then the third point was really, I, I guess, a little bit to Councillor Thaxter's uh, point about waiting lists, because it feels to me um, that actually the, what I hear our residents talking about is getting to a GP and getting those referrals. That's where the bottleneck seems to be. And maybe it's because, you know, the waiting list uh, for the diagnostic test is so great that they can't get through the kind of GP stage. So is this new system going to help with that, with those waiting times and with getting those referrals? Um, because I, I think I can kind of see what we're trying to do here. But I guess my concern is how is it actually going to help our residents with the problems that they that they really have and that they tell us that they have. Sorry, that's a bit of a long list, but I saw you writing it down, so that's I can repeat it. Hello, can I come in first? Because mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, they're all quite passionate about all of this. So, um, so where are they currently going? So I think the, the, uh, this comes back to one of the points that was raised, raised previously. So think about this as diagnostic capacity as part of the overall healthcare ecosystem. So. CDCs will not work in, in isolation. So it will be holistic as part of the overall existing diagnostic provision. So to answer your question very directly, primarily the services we're talking about are accessed via hospital settings. So um, particularly things like MRI and CT, they're not really, um, they're not really based in, in other facilities outside of the hospital. So for example, within this borough, you would have patients going to potentially Chelsea and Westminster, um, uh, or, or you know, there are obviously others sort of that aren't too far away, such as Hampton Hospital, for example. So, um, the majority of patients at the moment will be going to hospital based settings to access this type of care. Um, obviously, things like the bottom they can get closer to home and their GP, um, but for the sort of um, more significant uh, ICUs, they'll go into a hospital setting. All of that would still be there and available for patients and for the residents now. So we're not removing that. This is not moving care out of hospitals into the community. This is additional capacity over and above what is already there in the existing healthcare ecosystem. So just try to picture it in that way. So it really is more um, as opposed to replacement and movement of activity. Um, in terms of the timings um, and the risk behind that, so there is risk. I don't, I don't want to sit here and say there isn't risk, absolutely. Um, but the first of those is, um, is due to go live in Wilson Centre for Health and Care, which is a, 
uh, it was a, a PFI building, which by NHS standards uh, and compared to any of the hospital sites that myself or Phil work in, um, is in beautiful condition, uh, frankly, um, far better than any of the other facilities that, um, that we have available to us. So the works that are required to do that are very, very minimal. Um, so we feel we can manage that risk and the associated timescales with that. Um, ironically, the ones that are probably have more risk are the ones that are further away for what's over next year. Um, and that's because they would they will take the CT capacity, they will take the MRI capacity. We need to work with people like UK Power Network, for example, to get in um, more power to those locations. So you know that, that's where we, there's more complexity on the longer period. Uh, and obviously at the moment as well, a significant driver we're seeing is around the supply chain. Um, and that is a risk for us with um, uh, everything that's happening with inflation at the moment as well. So um, I don't want to understate the risks. There are risks there, but we're trying to manage those at a programme level uh, and obviously for our respective guidance of the programme as well. Um, so does that, sorry, just on this point then, so does that mean that people get a choice? Because obviously there's a difference between going to Chelsea and Westminster Hospital mm -hmm. for your CT scan and going to Ealing if you've got some disabilities. Patients will have a choice, yes. So if a patient wants to go to their local hospital, and we found this through the patient engagement that we did, public and patient engagement, patients want to either, there's two things that really come down to it. One is about actually how long do I wait to get my appointment? How long do I get my scan? And the other bit is about transport and accessibility of the site. Those are the two really predominant themes that came out from the patient and public engagement. Um, and that's a choice. People. And that will be um, up to residents to make a choice as to where they wish to choose for their care to be. So if they want to go to their local hospital, they absolutely have the provision to carry on there. Um, this is about providing another option, another site they can go to. And overall, when we talk about um, the CDCs, it is about providing more for the entire population. Um, it just so happens that we'll be, we'll be providing that over multiple sites. That's all. So does that then help with the referrals and the waiting lists? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, can I just, can I just ask a supplementary to that as well? The slack I'm going through, you said a lot of this would mean that some of these services are going out of existing places into these centres, but now you're saying they wouldn't be going out, they'd still remain there. So, can you just, just clarify that, please? It, it's a bit of a balance. So, for example, what you might have is um, you wouldn't shift everything, but because you're, we're dealing with you know, from the Mike Richards report, they're recommending that everyone works in a network. And North West London has worked at, from, a, from an imaging and, and this sort of side has been working as a network for quite a while. And so being able to move, you know, a few scans from one area to one which has more which has more availability. Plus, um, as you know, your, your borough is very large. Patients live, you know, obviously all over the place. There will be some patients who will be closer to Ealing than one of the other hospitals. And likewise, you know, that group, from there, you know, they may choose to go somewhere, you know, to one of these centres because it might be actually close to them. They might ne live near a train line which takes them to, you know, quite quickly. And so it just gives them that gives them that choice. And and, and just as an aside, we Imperial, you know, we created um, a an MRI hub of three MRIs, which are run in a, which is run at Ealing Hospital because they have the estate for it. We managed to set that up in a relatively fast fashion um, and. And that's been going, and essentially Imperial, um, which is you know, as you know, based in you know Mary's, uh, Hammersmith, and um, Chang Cross, they they look after that, and they all of their patients have the choice to go to that MRI hub, and they found it very successful. I mean, essentially, you know, from a capacity point of view, Imperial don't have all of that capacity, but this additional these new MRIs, you can say to patients, you know, look, you might have to wait eight weeks, but this place, you can get it done within four weeks. And we found that a lot of patients choose to go there within four weeks. Mm -hmm. it, is, it can be a little bit longer, but again, based on a lot of the um, transport stuff that uh, Damien and the team have done, you can see that within, for the majority of patients within the first London, uh, it's within around 45 minutes to be able to get to one of these, one of these three centres, let alone you know, existing hospitals, which again will provide that additional cover. So it's not a, it just becomes fluid. That's, that, that's the main thing. And being able to just shift things from um, capacity type areas to uh, improve capacity it just gives us that additional flexibility to be able to uh, cope with peaks and troughs, etc. Um, is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, sorry. Sorry. With, I'm sorry. I asked yeah. uh, many questions, too many probably, but I think we were talking about referrals yes. and uh, the impact on weight on weight lists. Yes. So um, with regard to the referral, it's 
it won't have a direct impact because um, at the end of the day, uh, GP availability patients is they sit obviously at the front line, and so um, we can't we can't provide any help from that point of view. But what we can do is uh, we're working with all of our uh, secondary care clinicians as well as uh, GP um, uh, GP representatives to look at pathways where we're able to expedite um, you know some patients who have very clear pathways. You know, for for, for cancer, for example. Um, for patients who have, you know, high risk for, you know, I mentioned for type of health checks, um, as well as things where they have vague symptoms with base uh, cancer symptom pathway. And so there are lots of pathways where, from a GP point of view, they can access diagnostics very easily. And that's the whole point of the community diagnostic centers to increase capacity within the, within the system so that they can access that very quickly. And so the aim is that if we can accelerate the downstream paths, then, you know, the overall journey will be a lot faster. But we won't be able to, like the front section, there might be a little impact, but it's not going to suddenly create a big gap, if, if, if that makes sense. So is, is what you're saying that these new community diagnostic centres are going to decrease waiting times for the test once you've got through your GP? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what and then is that a guarantee that you are going to give, or is that the hope, or, I mean... So How are we going to know if they're successful, I suppose? Yeah, so, ask it. so this is a national program, obviously. So um, being led through NHS England and improvements um, on behalf of the Department of Health and Social Care. So there's quite a lot of monitoring um, and effectiveness going into the outputs. Um, program, obviously, we're being monitored on a uh, sort of London and system level as well. So um, I think the scrutiny absolutely will be there in terms of, of that post, um, uh, post sort of implementation go live and actually, you know, Part of that for us is about looking at actually what is the impact, are we delivering the activity, what is the impact around waiting time. So as part of the uh, strategy that we set out, we set out a number of um, uh, metrics that we intend to measure as part of that once it goes live. Um, the, the, the key critical question there is, is around growth rates and demand. Um, going back to, to, you know, can we give guarantees? Um, what we have is a national projection by modality, um, so by individual tests on what we're anticipating that growth rate to be. And we've, we've based our capacity plan to try and address where we think that, that demand is, uh, where we think that growth is. Obviously, if that changes um, for, for reasons that we can't predict, then, then no, I can't sit here and say that you know, we'd be able to do that. But based on what we think the intelligence is um, at, a, at a modality level, we've tried to then build in uh, the capacity that we think um, the CDCs can provide Within the constraints of the program, let's be clear about you know, money is important here. Um, we would always like to build more if we could, but uh, we have to be, um, we've had to make you know, sensible decisions about actually where we can best utilize that. Great, thank you. Can we just jump in and ask one question yeah. slightly related? When when a service user has gone to one of these centres that have their diagnostics, what happens at the end of that? Because obviously, if you're in a hospital setting, the referral is made back to the specialist, presumably, you've seen. In this instance, do, do the diagnostics get referred back to a GP? Does it then place more pressure on the GP so it's, after that? That's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, it, it varies. So, for example, if the diagnostics are negative, um, and that's a choice, then that obviously goes back to GP, yes. they can be sure and they can sort of move on if needed or refer on if, if not. Exactly. And likewise, if there are, um, you know, if there is something that you find that requires on the referral, let's say, for example, if you find a, find a cancer, then those are the pathways we're working on to try to speed that up so that we really expedite the patient journey and cut out all the delays yeah. so that they go to one of these CDCs. And one of the, one of the benefits in our network is that they will be linked to existing hospitals. So we're, lucky, we're fortunate in that um, as a network, we're already linked in with regards to our radiology system. So I can see what's happening you know, from, from London Northwest, I can see what's happening at Chow West, I can see what's happening at Imperial, and, and, and likewise. And we're moving to the stage where we're going to have to share imaging across the whole network as well. So where, where someone has a scan at one place, if they, let's say, came from Chow West, that imaging, all of those results will be available on tap for a secondary care at Chow West, and then they can then, um, you know, take that further. Can so I just be really clear that the, the, if, if a onward referral is necessary to a, to a specialist that doesn't have to go back to the GP before being part of something because I think that is a 
yeah, when GPs are stretched already to have another yeah. repair of a clock? It, it, I have to say it depends because the GPs obviously as as frontline and as the gatekeepers a lot a lot of that information they know their patients well and it and with cancer certainly there's an argument that you could go directly back to secondary care but the difficulty is who's going to tell that patient you know so um, there is a, again there's a, there's a balance between expediting it as soon as possible and and also making sure that we get to the right decision for the patient and often the information to make that decision lies with the GP. And so it's quite difficult to cut, cut them out completely from the pathway because yeah. they often will have all that knowledge there because they're the experts. Um, no, I accept that. I, I completely agree with that. I just, I, I, I guess my concern was that particularly in the case of a like, cancer diagnosis, for example, not in the time is of the essence, um, having that referral made directly from all of these centres would, would probably save lives. Yeah, and I think that happens already okay. in a lot of settings. Um, for example, there are two way uh, referrals where GPs refer in and then they just, you know, if there's cancer, they sort of carry on. Um, I'm not going to say that it's a completely smooth system and um, super easy, but it's it's one of those things where, you know, with regards to CDCs, it allows us to look back at the productivity, at efficiencies, at integration, at pathways, and this is the opportunity to basically reform those with our GP colleagues. and you know, in view that we have additional costs. I'm just going to ask you a few questions, but I think we should probably do um, My first one is just the fact that um, these CDCs, sort of from the NHSC's guidance, were meant to be much more community-based and separated from medical centres and hospitals, whereas the three locations you picked here, one is in the healing hospital, the two are other at medical centres. So it's just understanding sort of why they've moved away from the idea that these might be based in shopping centres and football stadiums and places that are a bit more relatable and less scary to residents. Um, and then my second question was just on St Charles Hospital and I know this was a location that you were considering and it's within one of the most deprived neighbourhoods in North West London and why that wasn't chosen to be one of the locations and if there's scope over the next three to six years, I know I think the budget is currently whether we will be able to have a hub within um, North Kensington particularly and if that's not the case to ensure that our residents will not have any barriers to access for these hubs the fact that they are not living within these boroughs it doesn't stop them from being able to access the same amount of care that responds in um, these boroughs. Sorry, that's, that's yeah, I'd yeah, no, no, like to respond to all of those. So, um, oh, where to start? So the journey of some some of my approaches report goes back two years ago now. It was published in October 2020. Um, it was originally actually used to be published before the pandemic, and then things changed, obviously, as a result of that. So, um, I think the journey as a national program has changed in terms of their guidance. Um, so what, what they're very clear on is that there, need, there needs to be a separation of emergency and elective care. Um, so this is about providing elective um, diagnostic capacity outside of that emergency setting. So um, the, the only um, site that we have on a hospital-based setting where we have that emergency care is healing. Um, the building that we're using for that uh, was the only building we could use frankly in that area to serve that community. Um, and it's a building that used to run maternity services and actually now is largely vacant. Um, so it's a separate building from the hospital, it's not part of the main hospital site. So we'll have a segregated entrance and exit points um, and we'll be completely separated from that emergency care which is the really critical point that they've then focused in on. Um, in terms of the, so I've answered the first part, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the St Charles question, absolutely, and um, I remember also you, you raised it when I came to the, uh, the, the Joint uh, Health Notice yes. Overview and Exclusive Committee back in July. Um, it was one of our, I think, 67 sites that we had on our long list. Um, and it did make down to our shortlist, but there were there were problems with St Charles site in terms of the um, the estate and its its ability to actually adapt to uh, intensive requirements for CT and MRI in particular. Um, obviously, it's a uh, listed building, um, and that has significant planning restraints and constraints uh, around that. Um, but but more importantly, in terms of the accessibility uh, of that site, it had the lowest public transport accessibility level of any of the sites that we looked at. Um, so it goes on a range from 0 to 6, and uh, St Charles have a rating of 2, um, which is lower than, than any of the sites that we, we, we had shortlisted. So 
in terms of serving the deprivation, the travel analysis that we did behind that, St. Charles was not um, particularly accessible for, uh, it, it was accessible by fewer residents and fewer deprived residents across North Island. And um, just the barriers to access for residents, that's... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so we're working um, as a, from a hospital point of view, uh, there's a lot more integrated working across, you know, um, Nelson Westminster, which serves in this area, St Mary's, London, North West, Kingdom, um, and we're trying to work towards an, a, a single sort of patient timeline where patients basically get moved around. So the ones who are waiting the longest, they, you know, you shouldn't really have that, that should even out across North West London, as opposed to, as opposed to having um, certain areas which have a very high waiting list because that's their local hospital. Um, we're trying to even out, and this is part of it, by increasing increasing access for everyone, basically, within the family. So absolutely, there's there'll be no barriers to to access for for any person. Okay. Sarah, one very quick last question, then we well, it's three parts. And actually, well, James was at the meeting as well in June and July. Um, transport workforce and data. I was a bit disappointed to see this come back. Um, talking about uh, we have a large proportion of working age adults. We have the highest percentage of older people living on the way. Um, and I don't think that's been taken into consideration again. Uh, the, um, and you also mentioned we were the largest borough. I think we're the smallest borough. Um, transport. This is a real issue because the Mayor of London is proposing bus cuts. And a lot of those buses are the ones that go north, south, east, west. And they would take you to maybe to Wilsdon. So residents are not going to be able to get there. And there's a natural boundary there for us with the canal. People don't think about going north. So people in, in sort of, um, what's the ward in Westminster? Church? Church Street. Church Street. They come to St. Charles. People in Hammersmith and Fulham come to St. Charles. People in Brent come to St. Charles. For them, it's, it, it's, it's not a natural route for them to go north. I don't, it's just a block I think we all have. So again, I would ask you to look at St. Charles, because I really think our residents will go to St. Charles, they can get buses from the South the Borough, they can come from Paddington, they can come from all over. And then workforce. So some of the people that say are working in St. Mary's going to go to Wilsdon, or is it a completely new workforce? Oh, OK. Yeah. The reason I ask is, have they been consulted? Um, Okay, so a few bits there. So um, apologies if, if, if we've not quite provided the information that you asked, Councillor, and if there is anything that we can follow up on, um, happy to do so outside of the committee. Um, in terms of the, the, the transport and accessibility, completely recognise your points. Um, we did engage with TfL uh, as part of the process to look at where there were any proposed uh, changes to um, any modes of public transport, um, and we took that into consideration as part of the um, travel analysis um, position. So it was something we tried to get access to information on. Obviously, if that's changed, um, if there are now concrete plans that have changed, then obviously that may impact. There's um, proposals that okay. made a final decision, but it's big, it will make huge changes. Okay, so it would be helpful to understand if, if there are proposals, because it wasn't something that, say, we did try to get access to that information and um, was something we tried to, to take into consideration there through TfL. Um, in terms of the, the workforce, um, so the majority of the staff that will be recruiting into, to run the CDCs will be new um, new roles. Um, so we're not talking about this as additional staff, and that goes back to the, the risk that, uh, that Phil was alluding to earlier. There's a huge workforce asking. Um, and you know, we, we not only need to, to recruit more staff, but we need to think differently about how we do that. You know, we're not going to be able to just recruit um, radiologists and just radiologists, for example, we need to think differently about workforce uh, and transformation of the diagnostic workforce. We've got a huge piece of work to do there. Um, there will be um, the opportunity for staff, if they want to, uh, to move into these services. Um, and that's a question for if we do, I think we will, um, there will be some elements of consultation with staff, they've not yet happened. Um, but, uh, but absolutely, that's something constitutionally we have to do anyway. Um, with, with any of our uh, employees, if we are going to change any conditions of their, uh, of their work, that's something we'd, we'd look to do. But actually, we, we've been very um, uh, very open with, with uh, staff around this, and, and Phil and I go to, for example, what they call town halls, 
um, with each of the trusts, um, so with each of the um, uh, groups of workforce across the different organisations, and talk to them about things like CBP and present to them and tell them what's happening and what the implication is for not only for the population but also for them. Um, and now we're getting to the point where actually we've got some uh, firmer views around timescales and we've got money committed. So that's supposed to become real for um, for the organisations and staff and patients. That's something we absolutely um, will do as part of that process and is part of the conversations we're having uh, about how best to go about that. But we very much have the ability here to to do this in a way that is beneficial for our staff. Um, and just going back to the transport, you need to talk to some of the local authorities because they're putting in these low traffic neighbourhoods, which is stopping people driving everywhere. And if people, you know, as Anne said earlier, people with mobility issues or whatever, are going to have to drive or take or take a taxi. They're not going to be able to take a lot of I've been caught out by them myself. Twice. Um. Thank you very much for coming, and that was a very helpful. Sorry. Um, sorry, it's quite difficult to hear, so you might have actually answered some of these questions. But picking up what Sarah Lamb said, if we have about 21% of the rising of people over 65, and from your demographics on your map, you've got, um, I'm not saying that North Kensington is not deprived. But you have deprivation at the centre of the borough and, and south. That surely the emphasis of this should be early identification of uh, di and diagnosis. And so it should be about capturing data from the entire community. So I'm concerned with an ageing population in this borough, that that will be a deterrent. But it's also not clear. I was listening to the referral system, and that I wasn't very happy about that. How do you to one, then go back and get, seem to be going backwards and forwards? The travel, I think that if this was a planning application, we'd ask for a travel construction travel management plan, and I think that needs to be sorted out. Um, and uh, I just think you need to look at your figures, especially as we have a growth area of people of over 80. And we've had this problem with when the relocation of dementia services went north. Actually, if you're in the south of the borough, it's actually logistically quite difficult to get people who are ill on public transport to some of the services. Thank you. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, and also, it would be great if you guys could keep us involved in your conversations and sort of scope for there being an additional hub um, in North Kensington. And yeah, that would be the, the very helpful. Thank you, Amish. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Um, I think we're going to slightly rejig the audience to figure out what we have. If we have the 87 Gen 7 mental health plan next, and then 88 mental health plans, and then Sarah, welcome at the end. So, um, so the next, uh, next call for information on the development of the mental health plan by Tony Sarah Khan, um, I would like to invite Sarah Adbrook. Just the Savannah, so then I definitely got that wrong. I'm sorry. David Benner and Rachel Sonny to present the report. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, uh, Councillor. So, this is the mental health plan. Uh, I'm going to interview some of my colleague, Dave Bell, and goes into detail. So, the mental health plan, or we can call it a strategy that we chosen to call mental health. <coughs> this is come about after the COVID uh, impact on mental health services. So what we decided to look at what services what we have currently uh, and impact um, uh, on mental health following the COVID pandemic. Uh, and what else we need to do. So there's a lot of consultations have already taken place, or shall I say engagement. Um, and the mental health plan is almost there in a draft form, but this will be then consulted with uh, various organizations and, and community as a whole. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, but we want to be able to speak to many residents as possible and get their views on the current service and also the proper service. So I'm going to ask David to go through it. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, so we've, um, we've carried out a series of community engagement events. Uh, we did, uh, uh, we had the market store at uh, Portobello Road. Uh, that was quite successful. We had a number of different um, you know, residents approach us to give us you know, their kind of experiences of mental health. Um, you know, issues and um, what are the positives and maybe areas where service needs to be enhanced. So that was quite a useful, um, you know, event. We've also had a series of uh, meetings with stakeholders, um, you know, partners, where we discuss again what um, they're doing within their organizations to improve mental health delivery. So we had the police there, we had the Hampton service, you know, we had uh, um, you know, colleagues from, from CNWL, you know, where, where there uh, as well, and colleagues from uh, ICB also, um, you know, where they are from the in previously CCGs. So they were also there as well. So that was also a very useful um, event to try and understand um, some of the challenges around, you know, mental health service delivery um, in, in the borough and how things could be, uh, you know, improved. This is our first mental health plan, so we've never had um, in a previous plan, uh, you know, before. So and it's actually quite interesting to get a lot of people engaged to ensure that the, the plan, um, you know, covers all of the various kind of, you know, challenges and, uh, and issues and where services uh, could be enhanced. So as Bishra uh, mentioned, um, we've, uh, we've, we've got the first draft of the plan. And what was quite interesting about you know the the main methodology is around ensuring that um, we captured um, the narratives that have been expressed, especially by local people that have talked to us, um, you know, around you know mental health services. So um, what we've done is to uh, break that down into uh, you know six pillars, uh, you know, of key. Uh, areas where we feel that you know services uh, needs to be developed further, uh, you know, and, and enhanced. And you have all of those, uh, you know, six pillars, uh, you know, there, including what we expect to be uh, the, the kind of the outcomes. Um, you know, when the, the strategy or uh, the mental health plan is issued, uh, that will be a more detailed uh, narratives around you know the six pillars with some you know tangible. Um, recommendations in terms of the actions that we need to take forward. So um, we're not writing uh, this mental health plan just uh, to tick a box. We're actually writing it because you know we're really determined. Uh, working as uh, with partner with our partners, we're really determined to improve the mental health outcomes uh, in the for, for our local people. Um, and do you have, what is the sort of next stage of the report you're going to be producing where you have a bit more of an action points as to like how things can be done? Yeah, so, so we're expecting that uh, the, the first report, will be, the first draft will be published by the beginning of next year. And, um, and that is the stage where we then start the community consultation 
yeah. um, you know, with uh, you know our local people and also with organizations and all the all the stakeholders. stakeholders. And is that, you know, is that something that we, we could look at as a committee? Uh, yeah, that's something that certainly can be brought back to committee at a later stage. Because I think this is a great sort of building start, but it's, yeah. it's hard yeah. to kind of truly understand what. The plan. The, the, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, if we're only Gerald's going to say that you felt we were talking about how there's nothing you can disagree with here, but it's the sort of essence of the plan is it's to come, I guess. Yeah. So it will be very happy. Yeah. And then one quick question in that goes, Gerald. Um, I'd just be interested to know, you said in sort of the pillar one that service user, users that have performed you um, formed up with the difficulties of access and understanding the services. I'm just conscious and would be interested to, to know what they were finding difficult about accessing the services. And I mean, if you have a proposed plan, not just for access, but how we're actually going to educate people within this area of the services that are offered to them. And, what is there to help them when they are in a point of um, crisis? Because I think part of the problem is, is people aren't always aware of the different yeah. offerings other than their GP, which very often has a very long wait list for mental health support. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, two or three questions, really. Um, again, very good. The pillars are, pillars are great. Pillar three. Living independently and healthy life. And I think what we've experienced in the past is, and those of us who are sort of ward counsellors, a lot of our casework stems around. When it works well, it works well. When it doesn't, it's a nightmare. There's no mention in there of integrating housing in there and where the role of housing comes in. That's a key, a key problem. And then when something goes not to plan. Trying to get the case reviewed, trying to get a multi-agency meeting can take months. And then, in the case of housing, for example, if you have to get a, a court order reached, that can take another six months a year. And these, the community is suffering, but also more, more to the point, the individual is suffering because they're not getting the care. So I just would like to look at the extremes, if you like, as well, and how those fit in, because as war counsellors, we get a lot of problems with that. Secondly, am I allowed a second question? You, you um, <laughs> pillar five, service users with high needs. Just wondering what additional services we're going to see, what extra stuff we're going to see there that we don't already have. And then my third and final question is <coughs> the use of the voluntary sector in this. There are a lot of voluntary organisations out there, Samaritans, mine, all those organisations that offer huge support to people when they can't get onto the main system or they've got to wait six weeks or a month or six months, whatever. So I'd like to see some, some discussion of the role of the voluntary sector in this as well as the statutory sector. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to take them all or <laughs> <laughs> they get you to send them in? <laughs> Um, I would just like to know, in terms of access in services, what work will be done to identify and target those groups who find it difficult to access service? So how are you going to help those, the ones that are very hard to reach, you know? Not the ones that um, go out to clinics and stuff like that. And won't go, maybe won't go to their Exactly. And, and that could also, um, because of mental health, you know, and lack of behaviour, um, responsibility, anxiety, and all these other issues, how are you going to engage with those um, residents? And in terms of access and services, what work? Okay, I've asked you that one. Um, aim to eliminate gaps and boundaries to care for patients with complex needs. Firstly, what is meant by complex needs? Assuming it means personality disorder, disorder repeated presentation and substance misuse, what services are being created to meet the needs of those patients with complex needs? And the final one is I'm improving um, pathway and waiting times. How will this be evaluated? So I can take the last uh, question. I, mean, um, I guess, you know, obviously we provided a small uh, synopsis of what the mental strategy is um, trying to say. And, um, but what we are, the intention is that when we de develop the um, implementation plan or the implementation 
mm -hmm. um, that we we place it within our place based um, partnership. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so we do have um, a mental health program board as part of our place based uh, you know place based partnership uh, in a group, and you know, so to help in monitoring the progress of some of the um, you know the actions that as a partner organizations we are going to adopt as a way of enhancing uh, you know, mental health you know, services. So that is you know, one way of kind of you know, monitoring and obviously uh, attending you know, community meetings as well, speaking to various members would be another way of uh, making sure that you know, we, you know, there is accountability to uh, the promises that we've made uh, as part of a partner uh, organization. Thank you. And how will recruitment and retention be addressed? So there is um, a lot of work that we need to do around, you know, workforce development, mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that, you know, we're able to retain um, good quality, you know, you know, staff. You know, we believe that, you know, by focusing more on uh, social work workforce as part of a whole system approach, we'll be able to retain, you know, our social workers around, you know, that opportunity for, for career, career development. Mm -hmm. But it has to be um, a partnership work um, if we seam seamless um, the, the process, if we ensure that um, you know, we reduce complexities and um, fragmentations uh, within the system, then our staff will, fi will feel much more uh, comfortable with the work that they do uh, you know, in, the, in the local place. I mean, most of the things that you know, um, our staff tell us is around you know, you know, when things are not well joined up, um, you know, there's a lot of, kind of you know, reputation and duplication um, you know, within the work that we do. So that is one of the areas where we're really focusing on the workforce development. So in, in terms of the wider uh, mental health plan, there is a section there with regards to how we're going to retain staff, what support they are going to be, be given, um, you know, going forward. One. No, no, off to you. Uh, uh, actually, I just wanted to make a couple of comments, if I may, uh, if there were any questions. Um, and I, I think I've said uh, these comments before, but I just wanted to say them for, for the record on what, what I think I'd like to see in the next phase of this plan. And it's really about, well, I guess what we've got under um, Section 4, the current challenges and issues. So we see, you know, great increase in, in the demand for these services. And yet budgets, we know, are really, really under pressure. And we're going to look So even though we've got a 12% increase here, and I would... Guarantee it's going to be more than that. There's pressure on that money, so that's, I guess, what this plan is really at its heart going to have to try and address. And, and to me, it's about being very clear about which bits we have control over and which bits our partners have control over, and which bits we can we can make more efficient and better and scrutinise and have an input on. Um, it's also, I think. I was just thinking about the case studies and examples when Councillor Hargreaves was talking about war councillors and some of the case what we get. And, you know, I've seen many unfortunate, terrible stories of our residents with mental health issues and they just seem to get stuck in this system. They, you know, and you see the names, they come up again and again, right? We stabilise them and then back they come. And this is really what's putting the real strain. So what I'd like to see in the plan is... How do we actually get them out? You know, how do we not just stabilise them, but help them get better um, and, and improve their uh, quality of their lives and, and, and their, their mental well-being? And really, if that plan can go some way to talking about how we can do that, I think that would be a big success. But anyway, that's just a couple of comments from me. And I was going to say, Points are very valid, and we have had conversations before about that as well. Uh, like you said about the budget and the increase in demand for services going up, um, what we are, we have no plans to take any money out from the mental health budgets because we understand there is an increase in need. We've seen that since the COVID. Uh, and uh, therefore, most of these, the, the strategy, the plan, and also what David is also working on, uh, a transformation plan for mental health services. So that means now we have a, 
a, a good a partnership arrangement with CNW colleagues. So what we are trying to do is to look at uh, streamlining the social care aspect of the service coming under the local authority uh, management. What we will be focusing on more prevention and internet rather than intervention. So that means that uh, we'll be able to uh, quickly see patients or residents. Um, but the key is, is about partnership work with the um, mental health provider, in other cases, is the CNW. So we want to maintain that, continue to maintain the good partnership that we have with them. And also, you made a point about this, how much influence we have. Actually, if you look at the mental health uh, economy, the local authority spending is talking about 15 to 10, 10 to 15%. Most of them come from the health service. But we can make a difference by prevention, etc. And also, uh, Councillor Hargreaves' point is very valid. We we come across those cases, and their uh, delays in multi meetings, <laughs> etc., is a vicious circle. Is you know you sort it, you stabilize, and come back. But I guess that at least also part of the nature of the illness as well, isn't it? That people get better and they. But what we will be, this is an opportunity for us. This is the first time we're going to have a mental health plan. So we will, we will be very happy to receive comments and feedback from you outside of this. I'm sure yeah, agrees. Um, and we want to consult with as many people as possible uh, and many organizations. We want to get their views. Um, and we try to, you know, uh, uh, affect us if they will say anything from the government to the Stuart, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, probably to most of what I'm going to ask. Um, but, but I will say, I think I think all of these pillars you've described here are, 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 are great. They're very tangible as well. They're not just fake, so I was really well from that. Just as a slight follow-up, I, I guess, Given the budgetary pressures we've just, which are well known, I think seem to be a recurring theme of this piece, really. Um, how, how confident are we at being able to deliver this? Are there any particular points you think that could be pitchforks where you might have more challenge in terms of resource or budgets? I, I, I think the what we are going to, uh, what's going to be our top priority is the Banking agenda that uh, is is going to make a difference. Um, of course, when David organised that uh, first engagement event, and there were there were over twenty stakeholders were in the room, and they all were doing things to help people with living with mental health problems, but it wasn't streamlined or people didn't yeah. know what police was doing or what ambulance services were doing and we found out a lot about those are good services being provided by police and various organizations it is the other challenge this challenge is about coordinating working with all organizations and providing the sort of a seamless tailor-made service that is going to be a challenge but you know that, that is the partnership Work, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know what is quite useful at the moment is that we have the buy-in from all of our stakeholders, so they're really keen to see how we can improve uh, the services, and nobody is actually kind of you know resisting uh, you know change. So I, I'm quite optimistic that uh, you know we'll get uh, a lot of movement. Um, well, I think that was really helpful, Jeffrey, guys, and look over this. And I think if you guys would agree, it would be great to bring us a more developed plan of that particularly. Yeah. And if I could just say that, you know, obviously the timing of this is really important with the cost yeah. of living crisis. Mm -hmm. So if you have any thoughts or comments, further thoughts, can you yeah. please send them in. I think we've given quite a lot of knowledge in this so if, if so they haven't been all jotted down by you, but there's no exception, we've got the minutes. 
Thank you, guys. So, um, so the next item on the agenda um, is my colleagues from the NHS and regarding the meetings of mental health clubs in Borough. I'd like to call Saru Rukama, Clara, Director of Mental Health, to present the report, which is joined by Mike Booker, Deputy Clara Director. Jasmine Yunjina, is that you? She's coming to me. She's not that well. Uh, I'll call it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, Thank you, councillors, for giving us the opportunity to come and talk uh, about our community mental health apps, uh, transformation journey and the patient journey. So we transformed our mental health hubs uh, in November 2021. And um, this was alongside the NHS long-term plan uh, in terms of integrating our secondary mental health services, uh, working with closely with our GPs, uh, community living well, tech sector partners, um, having employment support in our teams, and really looking at the population-based for our residents and our patients. And um, I will do the introduction, then my colleagues will chip in as we go. So in terms of where we are with the community transformation, I think we have presented some data. We've seen an increase in referrals. Uh, some of that, you know, you can see uh, even post uh, pre-pandemic, our referrals were at a static kind of, you know, we do have the ups and downs. And you know, during COVID, you can see the same level that is going to be but it's been transformed. There's been a significant increase in our demand, and we have, you know, in terms of our relationships with our GPs, I think that has been really, really good. Uh, we've got um, as workers who work alongside our GPs in terms of our residents having a one-stop shop. Uh, so that actually we are not seeing our thing. It's been mentioned before around people having a lot of assessments, but also people being moved from pillar to post to access services. We still have our single point of access, which we work you know, very closely with. You know, and they take on all the agent referrals and all the routine referrals are come, coming into our community apps. We are working very closely with our community living well. And I think that with the, with the goal to actually work on that early intervention, early help, you know, information to you so that actually you prevent people coming in through the secondary services that actually do a lot of work with our community. We know that there is a lot of work that we still need to do. We have been engaging with our service users and our carers in terms of the transformation journey, but I don't think we are there yet. I think there's more to do in terms of our homes in terms of actually reaching out into the community and actually asking the residents what they want to see in our community hubs. And we are starting to do that work. So I'll hand over to Clara, she will talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I suppose some of the things that come up from the conversations that, that have been around the table this evening was thinking about those people getting discharged to nothing, or, or they were actually one of the main principles from this model is no cliff edge. It's actually what we want to do is make sure we link people in with our third sector partners, use employment support to give them roles, routine, meaningful occupation as part of their lives so that actually they have a support network in the community. And as Saru alluded to, we really want to sort of start some more community connection work, working with communities and populations to be that support network for people out there. Um, I had a couple of things. Um, I think one of one thing I wanted to ask you is it the been years since you were um, I want to sort of understand what you have learned, um, what's worked, what's worked less, less well, and sort of where you identify further improvements going forward. Be interesting. And then my second question. What's this about um, on the delivery model? When it sort of talks about the two um, options where it says give advice to referral or sign closely, and then it says case codes, just a sort of understanding of what that means in terms of what 
someone's coming to you with, is, does that mean that their journey with you guys completely ends, or are they still being contacted by your help? Just to know that people aren't sort of just being lost. Start with that one. Yeah. Um, the idea really of the model is just, is, you know, it's about flow. We are closely connected to our GP practices now and the third sector and the community. Uh, we've got mental health, usually nurses within each PCN now, senior nurses who actually can do the rapid assessment. You spoke about long waiting times for GPs. Actually, the GP identifies a need that can be seen within a week by a mental health nurse. If they've got more higher needs and it's very obvious they've got a need to be seen by what used to be secondary care they will go straight to the hubs we can get the assessments done in uh, in the gp practices as well now so actually that's hoping to we want sort of no barriers we want to reduce the barriers we want to make people easy in easy out actually into the community we don't want people to be institutionalized within mental health services we want people to live as normal a life as possible and as well as possible in the community so there shouldn't be any barriers actually there shouldn't be significant waiting times for people to be seen. We, we have a, a sort of target of uh, 28 days for people to have an assessment once they've referred in, and we've managed to achieve that since we went live. So that, that's really good. Um, we really want to do better. We want to do better in our bridges. So I think that was the second question. Yes. And the first question was what the learnings be and what the benefits yeah, what, be. Yeah, what, I mean, what have you seen really work? Are there any areas that haven't worked? And so does that mould where you guys are going to be? For me, what's been really, really positive, we've got not just the kind of traditional multidisciplinary team within the hub, we now have got employment support, we've got uh, care navigators from the third sector, we've got peer support workers from MIND, and we're all based under one hub. So we can of offer a multitude of psychosocial as well as medical interventions for service users that come into our services. So that, that for me has been a real um, positive um, Shifting cultures within the team can be a challenge, and that's something that we're working on. We really want to go for an intervention-based model, evidence-based interventions, not sort of holding somebody under mental health services for years on end without any effective care or treatment. That, that doesn't benefit anybody. So actually shifting that culture within our teams has been a struggle, which we continue to, to work on. Um, I think, you know, the other challenge that we've had is, you know, I think everyone has said it, workforce, you know, recruitment yeah. and retention of staff. And we, we are really, really looking at really how do we recruit differently from what we, we know. I think, you know, it, it's that culture change again of how do we actually, we, we've got communities that are expertise in terms of what's in the community and we've got third sector partners that actually we can work more closely with. So we're really thinking around, you know, community connectors, but also learning from friends or colleagues because they are kind of, um, recruiting differently and they are kind of, they are also taking that learning in. Yeah. And the other thing I think, you know, that uh, we are quite proud of is that we've recently uh, recruited some uh, general nurses into our community hub to really look at the physical health because we know that it's, it's an issue and just trying to push, you know, for that for those annual checks to make sure that after everyone that is on the case load is, you know, having their annual checks. And that's been a challenge. But I think we are now starting to see that we are starting to meet our targets again. I think also that the GPs of some of the GPs have uh, highlighted how uh, much they feel they benefited from a closer working relationship with the hubs. Yeah. So that's a We're developing monthly MDTs with each network, actually, with one of our consultants dedicated to each network. It's been really positive. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Community Health Pathway, I think I've worked my way through it. Um, <laughs> what's the time frame we're putting on that? And just the second bit that often people with mental health issues can come in and out of mental health, and they can, they can be years apart. You know, um, How easy is it for somebody to slot back into the system if they've been out of it for a year, two years, or five or ten years? Very much needs based. That as soon as a need's identified, we, we will get them, they can be straight back into us. So we've got the, the specialist nurses within the PCMs now. Um, so they're there, their point of contact and point of reference with the GPs. We are rolling up, we've got our second, uh, we've got one network has got regular monthly MDPs established, and we're trying to roll that out across our other PCNs as well. And that's an opportunity to discuss these kinds of concern. But as I say, we've got the nurses on the ground as well. But we, we take, 
the referrals will come in. They're, they're often looked at within two days. They're all seen, they're screened for priority, and actually everybody's often assessed within 28 days. But prior to that, prior to um, arriving there, there's the um, uh, single point of access, and they will pick up um, uh, the needs of somebody if it's urgent, uh, so they can be seen that day. So there's uh, a rapid uh, interventions are available to you within the trust, and then uh, they'll either come straight into the hubs, or the referral won't be deemed uh, to need um, a rapid intervention. They're coming to the so they can be seen early, uh, but if they come into the hubs, the process is retarded. That's fine. And then the sort of length of time going through this is it. Needs led again based on patient needs, patients' interventions that are identified, what, what, and we, we, we're moving to using a tool called Dialogue at the moment, which is a, a sort of a care planning tool, an assessment tool that is um, a sort of a user completes the tool and it identifies what their priorities are for their recovery and we very much base all our interventions and are offered around that. So it's very much that issue that they So we're not doing things to people that we think are right medically focused, which is what we used to do, uh, we're working with partnership person to identify what their goals are, uh, what they hope to get out of seeing us, um, and to work alongside them to their recovery. And there's a big star chart in the pack, uh, di spider diagram, that sort of gives you an idea of the range of interventions that were on offer. I think that's page page. Page 42, so that's got an idea of the, the, the roles we had in posting circles when we transformed a year ago, and in the stars are sort of the new and emerging roles that we're, we're, we're coming on board as well. Can I just make one plea again on the, the voluntary sector? Sorry? The voluntary sector. Yeah, peer support um, workers are provided by voluntary sector. We've also got our care navigators right. are provided by the voluntary sector, and it does have uh, voluntary um, BCSE, the voluntary sector organisations as well. We're hoping to develop those relationships as well. We do a lot of work with SMART, we work closely with SMART and MIND in particular. So, you know, one quick point. Can I commend you on the sort of report because I think it's really clear mm -hmm. that patient journey is fantastic. But if users are getting us on the ground, I think, I think we're on to really good things. So, thank you. Just very quickly, what, uh, it's very difficult, I think, uh, with mental health because it's very complicated and complex. What are your what are your KPIs? What, what, you, what, what, what how do you measure whether this has been a success? Because we know if you go to the hospital and you have a treatment, a treatment on a physical problem, the problem is fixed. But quite often that's not the case. How do you so, so I think in terms of KPIs, I think you know it's rather kind of polluted with some of them. So we've got the set national KPI and appended the targets. We've got uh, the agent routine referral bit, which we have uh, kind of shown in our data set. But on top of that, I think it's important to get the qualitative data from the patient. So we do have uh, patient feedback um, that we, we present uh, to patients, and we do it over the phone as well for patients to find out how to find our service, and we use some of that as a way of measuring you know, how well we're doing, where we need to make improvements. But alongside that, you know, we do use, you know, our complaints, compliments, as part of, you know, trying to improve our services where things have gone wrong. And, you know, of course, we don't want serious things, that, but they do happen. It's really, you know, embedding that learning uh, things to go wrong. But also using compliments as a way of where we are doing well and sustaining that. But alongside that, I think it's important that, you know, we are really, really trying to have people with lived experience in the team because that's always have, you know, that service user voice is important in everything we do and we want to encourage that and it's something that, you know, I think the co-production bit as mental health workers, we've not done that very well because we've been scared, you know, if there's a power thing that has gone on for years and years, but I think we are moving, you know, from that and really, really thinking around co-production, co-design, and hearing the patient's voice in everything that we do. That's good, yeah, because I, I, the, the KPIs for your sort of internal targets about how quickly people are seen and things like that, they're easy, really, to identify, aren't they? But it's that, that layer where are people getting the support? Mm -hmm. 
if they need. That's a bit more difficult to measure. Just a specific question. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, you know, on your bra, it says um, in May 2022, it is approaching the double and double country limit, yet you tend to 28 with all time target and still achieve 99% of patients. How is this being achieved? 2022. 2022. Yeah. So uh, it's approaching double. And upper control limits. How oh, you mean the diagram yeah. in terms of the referrals yeah. coming yeah. in? And you're still able to maintain. I, I, th I think they're uh, a month behind. So we've got the 28 pieces measured from the 28 days from mm -hmm. that day. So, that, so there's capacity, and you can see they actually dropped in the subsequent month, I think. So they went down slightly. But what we do, we look very much at our sort of capacity and demand in the team. Mm -hmm. And when we need to flex, and we've got sort of named workers who carry out interventions, when we need flexibility in our number of assessment stops, we sort of flex for that. So we look at our averages, our numbers, and we offer that many initial slots a month, if you like. And if we see that, and actually we, we allow this leverage within that, um, because there's always work to do with at some part in some part of the team. So it's very much reviewing our figures every month and, and making sure that we've got the capacity to meet the demand really and by flex, flex be placing people where they need where they're needed. We usually have two people on duty, so they have slots to do capacity to do assessments. And some of this goes to all the different sort of strands in the hub. You can see we've got a sort of psychology hub, so sometimes they'll be the people to do the assessments. Um, so it's really just utilising all the resources we have in the hub to do that. If you could clarify for me, um, on the community hub part where it talks about um, presents at GPE, etc. I know we looked at access to mental health services last year, I think it was last year, um, and one of the issues was the voluntary sector found it difficult to refer people in, and I just wondered if there'd be more work on that. Probably not more closely with the people we work closely with, so certainly with Smart and Mind, that's certainly not something that they fit very much as part of our sort of uh, strategic meetings, and that's not something we've heard as an issue, but potentially it's something I've not heard since I've been in post from other third sector organisations, so it might be something we need to reach out and do a little bit more work on. The volunteer centres will start when they were hearing from the other voluntary sectors, and again, I think people like in the days, you know, they've got people that won't naturally go to clinical setting. It might be good to okay. liaise and we can, I can do some more work on that and touch base with them. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have got a couple of questions. Um, I'm looking at this. Um, what questions come to mind? I mean, sometimes mental health is associated with addictions. And I can't see how this comes into this spiral. Um, so, if you have a hub, uh, are you going? Are you are you doing outreach, or do people have to make that positive stage of engagement? Because some people, if they do have a problem, don't wish to engage. They need to be nurtured to engage. Um, and so, do you work with organisations like Look Ahead, Turning Point, and others? Um, do you actually go into those properties to be able to support people? Um, have you do outreach in housing associations where perhaps you might have nominations of uh, vulnerable people? And from a totally personal experience, I think single point of access is an absolute nightmare. I don't think it helps. I think it's actually sometimes it's a real block to try to get effective support. And as uh, Councillor Aubrey has mentioned earlier, we have people who return the whole time. So you can have a plan of action, but if you have people that have complex needs, I'd like to see slightly more detail as to how those people can be supported, because those can be years they might not acknowledge part of their problem, but they are a substantial problem to themselves and everybody around them. Yeah. Should, should I take on this further? So, so the, the single point of access um, point that you've made, I'm, I'm sorry that you know, 
it's, 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 it's been a nightmare all the time, the experience you've had. And I know that you know, have had a counselor in my mom, which is the counselor. There's one counselor who just reached out to say that there's been complaints from the resident that they have to be able to access, seeing the public access, and the workers have visited. Now that they seem to go to the team. So that, you know, but I think what's happening with single point of access now, now that we've moved the between the fellows and the house are waiting for the regime, they are doing their own transformation in terms of single point of access. So they are looking at um, embedding the energy of the core into the single point of access. They do it already, but they're looking at how that can closely link in the single point of access, but also they're looking at their the team that are working is in the front of access in terms of uh, the schemes that they're putting there, you know, really having trauma informed approach into the care that is being delivered, but also having health sector partners in single point of access and people with lived experience who perhaps not been there before. So, you know, I would be so happy to kind of contact you outside of this, you know, to see if there's anything that we can do to get that inside uh, single point. I'm, I'm just saying that um, I've had to call it on a couple of occasions when the people have been, been suicidal. And um, they might not necessarily have remembered their year, birth year and but they might have remembered their 1st of May. To be run back two days later to say we can't take that case, we didn't pursue it because we didn't have the right birth birth year. It was inappropriate. So the next time the person presented, I just called 999. But actually, a mental health professional would have been a far more appropriate course of action than the police who merely stabilize somebody and leave them in their accommodation. And that doesn't, doesn't help. Actually, you know, single point of access now works closely with the team called first response. So really, we don't want people to be calling emergency, you know, the ambulance for a mental health problem because we should be able to address that. So they, they should be able to dispatch a first response team that can come out with people if it's an urgent need in terms of mental health access. We really can be I wish you well, but you need to deal with your addictions. Yeah. And the colleague. I submit with regard to the hubs, we work really closely with, with regard to addictions and we've got a dual diagnosis, uh, KCW-wide dual diagnosis specific service that we work really, really closely with. And we also work really closely with Turning Point, CGL, and we've also got a new team that's developed to do lots of assertive and intensive work with service users who are admitted to St. Charles Hospital, called the REST team, and we've seen some really Good outcomes actually since they say that when did they start in April, March, any time? March, yeah. So, we, so that, that's actually you know, a presentation from the rest team about how well they've done and the outcomes they've achieved on Wednesday. And it's been really, really impressive the work that we've done. So it's certainly, I actually think we need to start thinking about embedding some more of that work in the hubs and that's in the pipeline. And the slightest um, follow up on that point around your housing and our English. And some of the um, of early dimension and education that we do got um, we work quite closely with the um, supported housing services here. So um, we meet regularly with the uh, providers, the different providers that uh, are commissioned by the Water Authority. Uh, and we've also done some uh, work with the wider uh, housing group, and we actually with, we're engaged with uh, the the veteran um, powers of here and weeks ago, and we have plans in place to uh, um, look at how we can um, work together to support people that uh, are in crisis within, uh, within their housing. So, I think the main point is that if you have, as we do in the centre of the borough, you have a high level of single homes mm -hmm. through the housing. Common housing register, you will have people nominated who have a high um, level of vulnerability, either mental health, addiction, whatever, and they don't get the support that they need, and therefore 
either their chaotic lifestyle goes undetected or they get into further trouble. So actually, we need to be having services that respond to that need and therefore work with general, general needs housing associations. And I think that's, that's, that's quite a good point. We will probably pick up on the uh, mental health plan and our collaboration around um, you know, some of the important early intervention around uh, substance issues and uh, the colleagues uh, as well. Thank you. Um, one last question. Sorry, um, just as <laughs> Councillor Way just mentioned, oh, we just brought back some memory. A few years ago, um, we had to fight for um, this single point of access, reducing from 7.1. Now, since then, we haven't actually had a report mm -hmm. as to how it's going, the pros, what's working, what's not. Can we have a report on that, please, and give you a range of visits? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I apologise, we did have a visit arranged, and I went to break my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so once we are rearranging that, we yeah. will definitely yes. put you in that okay. and you know, I'll, I'll reach out to colleagues and see the point of access for the report. Yeah, I think that was one of the main concerns because um, a lot of residents who have been taken to the south of Bara, it's very difficult for them to come back to the north. You know, and some of them, of course, they've been mistreated and stuff and if you're away from family, they've got mental health issues. Which you know is a broad spectrum, mm -hmm. so we just like to get some feedback from that as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys very much, and it would be great to get a report and a signal as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is. Uh, so we've requested the reports from the new member to present to the authorities. We are coming here to the sanction of the work committee. Now I'd like to answer if there are appropriate numbers of health so you can have to speak to the result. Well, I wasn't actually going to say very much because I thought there was some, I apologise for the length of the report, but I think as some of the committee were new, that it's probably been idea to put a bit more in um, because we were referring to things like section 75. Um, so I'm hoping you've read it. Um, if you've got any questions? Page mm -hmm. okay, six. Do you want? Yeah. Yes, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Which social care is being brought internally to our community? Is there any reservation about the change in workforce, workforce terms, and conditions and bandits? So this is going to happen. Next March, so next March. Uh, next March. At a time where there's emphasis on mental health and social care being integrated, this will risk fragmenting in services patient receive. So, this is what we've been talking about earlier. How will the um, risk be minimized? No? Yeah. Yeah, sure. um, I, my my point was on number six, which was hospital crashes, and that we had no budget confirmed. I should concern. We're in the same position, and Rachel's good enough to do And then just going into concerns having COVID rising, and how we can actually know we can mitigate the crashes and don't have to be disrupted by them. If there's been any updates since this report's been. Uh, no, we still are waiting our exact allocations for winter funding, yeah. um, and then the Secretary of State announced on five hundred million. We are we are relatively confident that that funding will be received potentially via the NHS. We need to, we are developing a plan as we speak on the things that that will and could fund, uh, and should we not receive it, what the risks are uh, for the winter and beyond uh, if that funding is not secured. And just to add on that, we've actually written to the Secretary of State and asked that that money be paid directly to the local authorities and not by the ICS, um, which is the current plan. So, yeah. Please, no questions there as such, but uh, paragraph five, home care transformation. Just really, 
some some concerns around how that works in reality, challenges that people have in managing their own budget. If we have in a digital care coordination service, I don't know what that means, but I know that, that a lot of residents have problems now with an undigital one, without moving to a digital <laughs> one. Um, and it just concerns me. It just concerns me. We don't have the providers, we don't have regularity with the providers, people find difficult managing their own budgets and, and issues around that. And once they start to get into a problem, the problem is multiplying in terms of getting into arrears in payments and all sorts of things. So so we are recommissioning the Holy Book. Um, that's going on ongoing at the moment. I think once it's completed the next year now. I can't remember. Next year, yes. Um, but you know, with COVID, some people did adapt to digital. So there is a big change in what we're going to be doing and what the offer will be. Um, but we can always get something from commissioning. I actually came to scrutiny in March. Uh, so that's what oh, no, was it the one before? Yeah, I think it was a paper in December 2021 on the yes. commissioning process. Okay. So we can certainly bring it back to you when we're a bit further on. And that choice remains. Yeah, yeah. Yes. they're not yeah. Yeah. required to yeah. use that. Yeah. But I, I think that's the key point is that people have choice to choose to have non digital, regular home care if they wish to have that type of service. So this is not, we're not saying to everyone you should be having direct payments or digitalized care. <laughs> so they have a choice. And some people choose, so the young people, learning disabilities and physical disability, they uh, tend to like direct payments um, and direct payments via the digital, digitalized. Um, so they don't need to do all these you know, payroll and all these things. So a simplified version of direct payments through a digital platform. And that's what we're talking about, this current care. So it's a platform where we, anyone who wants to provide care, they can register themselves uh, and they are vetted and uh, safe uh, and they get paid via the current care. But at the same time, the service users, the residents, they have a choice to choose uh, uh, who do they want to interview, who do they want to employ, and they can interview people. So it's giving them some choice rather than um, asking an agency to go and start with really someone to it, it has always been the issue. Yeah. It's the ones that work, work well, yeah. it's the ones that don't work. Yeah. And, and we pick up those. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I have and, agree. And getting a, it's not just a mess they get into, it's a, it's a concern, it's a worry, it's a stress, yeah. and all of that. But, but if you get any cases, you must let us know because if you don't let us know, it may not get you know, recorded yeah. anywhere. Um, and we've got no way of monitoring it. So I just have um, one comment to make on this, which is Max Sinner. <laughs> My personal welfare. So, yeah, I, I feel like um, at our social care, this department has been actually really good at providing all of the information that's required um, to Max Sinner. But how are we going to hold the league member for the property to come and tell us when this thing is going to be built? I mean, there's, there's no timings on this. Yeah. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment, as you well know, Anne, because you did a huge amount on this. So thank you very much. And you're well but it needs to move. It no, I know. To, so I think going. we are hoping to be able to bring something to leadership in December. Yeah. That's what we're hoping. Um, because we need to get it done. Oh, and the work kind of is expected to start sometime. But yes. Okay, well, we'll have an update, I'm sure, at the next um, scooting meeting. Yeah. It's like Dots Road as well. I mean, those two mm. really, really good. I'm not sure Dots Road, but yeah. Yeah, both of them. We'd like to work with them. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So, um, the final report this evening is the Committee's own work programme update report. So this is the latest iteration of the Select Committee's work programme.
And it's based on the priorities which members of this section see identified earlier in the summer, which we discussed and explored at a scrutiny committee in July. Um, and it sets out simply that um, the forthcoming reports, and we should just draw select committee's attention to the next meeting, Thinking Ahead, which is in November. And it's proposed by the members that you have a report on obesity and prevention. And secondly, you have a report on the Safeguarding Adult Executive Board Annual Report for 2021 2022. And I should just mention as well that. When you discussed your priorities earlier in the summer, you did identify palliative care as one of your priorities for this year. Uh, it, it doesn't feature in the work program at the moment because um, I think the committee members felt you weren't completely sure where the NHS were with that change proposal, but they have been in contact to say that the engagement process has started. Thank you. Um, also, to, just to say as well that we, um, uh, the committee, or the borough assembly is represented on the North West London Joint Health Scrutiny Committee as well, which was referred to, and um, our representatives have attended in, in July and also um, in October as well. Um, so, you guys are happy with what it could be a good idea to bring out of care in November? Yeah, yeah. I just to have a more of an update on Cambridge. They've said it, Josh, that they were in their final stages of trying to form a plan and I just think that would be as we've only really got um two things, two reports on the agenda. I don't think it would be too much if you guys I agree. Great. There's just dental provision come under us because I'm increasingly getting people Asking about NHS dentistry and dental NHS. within the borough. I mean, we can encourage people. We did that big pearly whites thing years mm. ago with the. Seeing the provision of it as much as as um, mm. the capacity within dentists and the provision of it and like. Mm. Yeah, we just. Oh, did they? Yes. So apparently Westminster mm. invited them to their scrutiny. Mm. That might be worth looking at that. You can ask them to attend. Mm. Then being in it, yeah, the primary care, right? Primary care leads. So it, it does come under your uh, remit as a committee council, I believe. So, um, if the committee so wishes, uh, Hannah and myself could find relevant data and information from the NHS, so close that all the members and you could decide whether or not that's another item that you might want to look at in the future as well. I mean, then that's a good idea. It's a big issue. Just to note that public health has uh, engaged with the more health program, particularly with our care homes uh, and our schools, uh, both of which areas I think there's some uh, significant work to do. There are, there are drug problems. I would also like to add something to the agenda, Chair. I think it's in our best duty to call in continuing care, who's in charge of home care workers. Mm -hmm. you continuing health care, that's the NHS again. Uh, continuing care, so they're being commissioned to get home care workers to go in the county. Are they not about? It must be in the chairs. You mean continuing care? Yes. yes. So, so basically, they're the one that's in commission to go. Out. Is it an agency? It's not an agency. They recruit the agency to go out. Right. So it's a continuing care team. Mm -hmm. Continuing care team would um, would commission nursing and fund nursing placements yeah. for people. Um, and sometimes care as well. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that, that, yeah, that comes organize. under the continuing healthcare team of the NHS. Yeah. But we can organise. We can facilitate. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Chair agrees. Maybe an early next year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.